So I seem to have become the permanent uh, conversation interview person on the couch with, but we haven't got a couch. Um, so. Orlando, I am looking forward to hearing from you about your perspectives on culture and systems, and especially hearing you talk earlier about being a psychiatrist and working inside organizations in this role and looking at the systems of the organization. That, and I'm thinking very much here that this has echoes of Eric Byrne and he wrote many papers in the 1930s and 40s and later about psychiatric systems. So I'm looking forward to hearing your take on these systems. But before we go to this, I would be really curious to hear from you. When did you in your life first become conscious of culture? Uh, I, I began my professional life in a place, in a setting where there was a double culture. Because when I was studying um, as a doctor, when I was doing medical school, I was in the army. And I spent 20 years in the army. Twenty years during which I tried to bring together the uh, army culture, the medical culture, and uh, psychological culture. Eh? It, it wasn't that easy. And the other experience that I had was that I worked in the army. And for a short period, although it was very, very intense, I worked in the prisons. I was also a, a volunteer worker uh, with alcoholic, uh, alcohol addicts. And then I worked as a psychiatrist in a public setting, in a public institution. Uh, in each of these systems, I, uh, io ho portato altra cultura. No. Ah. And so in each of these systems, I brought in uh, different levels of culture, different cultures. Because in the meantime, I had also started training in TA. And I was the only TA person in all of the other groups. And so I had to uh, find the points in common amongst all of these cultures and little by little also try to reconcile the different aspects present in these cultures. And the first thing that I had to come to terms with is that there is no right viewpoint. In each of these areas, I had people that were very much like me. But with none of them did I really feel totally at home. Yeah. 
That's an interesting phrase to use about feeling totally at home. So home was yet another culture. Home is another culture. Uh -huh. And this makes me think about Bent's work on roles, because it sounds as if you had a number of different roles, uh, some in the professional world, some in the private world, and some in perhaps the organizational world. And I guess my curiosity is whether you felt you had to reconcile these different cultures inside you, or did you s experience being a visitor, a tourist, into different cultures? Wonderful question. I think that in different moments, I uh, experienced both of these conditions. I was uh, part of these situations. And so I uh, could not not feel that I belonged to them. But I never felt that I fully belonged to them. And this is a characteristic also of my personal life. Because I was born in Rome, grew up in uh, Livorno, then I went to Florence. My parents came from other towns. So I don't know which is my town. Some of them are my home, but not all of them. And this is true also professionally for me. That's really interesting to hear about that earlier experience. And I would guess you learnt how to behave in each of these different cultures. Rome, Livoni, and so on, and that this was helpful to you later in your professional life to be able to move between these different organizational cultures. So it sounds as if your awareness of culture, maybe not conscious awareness, but an awareness of culture happened to you early in your life, much earlier. Yeah. And as you discovered these different cultures professionally in these different systems, what did you begin to understand was the meaning of culture? I think that each culture acts as a sort of filter in the way you read facts. And I think that each culture uh, predisposes individuals to give a certain reading of events. It's as if a culture uh, provides you with rules as to how to behave in a certain situation. And this means that uh, from in a professional setting, certain problems need to be dealt with in a given way. And if someone deals with them differently, 
then that's a bit out of, um, it's not right. When I was in the military, I was a doctor. I was a funny sort of military. Uh, um, uh, amongst doctors, being a psychiatrist, then I'm a, s a funny sort of doctor. And amongst psychiatrists, <laughs> being a TA, uh, an analyst, <laughs> I was the one that had three balls. <laughs> and at times this turns into an advantage. Because a, a person who is somewhat weird, let's say, can do weird things. Uh, what comes to my mind is the fool or the buffoon at court who was the only person who could uh, look at the king or challenge the king. And I also think in my mind, Eric Byrne's idea of the person from Mars. A bit weird from outer space. In the army, which is obviously a very hierarchical structure, being a doctor, I was allowed to say things that other people could not afford to say or to do. Uh, so, from a professional point of view, what I have found to be very important is to uh, know or be fully aware of the culture that I'm in and be able to introduce elements from another culture. If someone were to ask me uh, to, to say what uh, social psychiatry is in a nutshell, well, that's, that would be it. So, as you're talking, I'm thinking about um, a lot of the work of Eric Byrne in the 1930s, um, which he tried to continue after World War II, when he traveled to many different cultures to look at how mental illness was defined and the nature of the psychiatric institutions which were there. And I think although it's not stated so clearly, he seemed to draw the conclusion that mental illness is defined by the culture and can be very different in some of the Pacific Islands, for example, compared with the United States or Bulgaria, some of the countries he visited. But I was wondering also, from your experience, to what extent you see cultures creating these different organizational cultures creating various um, symptomatic schemas amongst people. So being a cause as well as being uh, the containment that Byrne talked about. Uh, this is interesting because in Italy we had a movement which was uh, against psychiatry, anti-psychiatry. And at one point the psychiatric uh, hospitals or institutions were closed down in Italy. And we're, we're the only country in the world that doesn't have psychiatric uh, hospitals. even though some countries started out with the psychiatric communities before we did. But we're the only country that has this radical position, this radical form. Uh, 
And in my opinion, the mistake lay in the fact that uh, there were two cultures set against each other, each of which denied the other. A, psychi a traditional, psychiat a traditional psychiatric uh, culture that would say schizophrenia exists and you need medical treatment. Or at the most very refined uh, psychological techniques. Another, the other culture would say no, it's the environment and all the rest has nothing to do with it. And my position is that neither of these two is the truth. But both positions contain some degree of truth. There's a study by WHO on schizophrenia that tells us that schizophrenia, or what we define as schizophrenia, is present to the same extent or degree in all over the world. It's from 0.8 to 1.5%. To one, to one uh, but the, the same study tells us that the way this um, uh, disorder has evolved is different uh, in the various cultures. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Sioux, uh, Sioux uh, Lakota in the north of the United States, those who heard voices were, was not considered to be a, a, a schizophrenic person, but he was touched by uh, the God and he was held in great esteem and needed neither to work nor get married. And we know that these are the two big problems of someone who's schizophrenic. These people had delusions, hallucinations. They weren't capable of working on equal terms with others. nor could they have a normal type of relationship. And we call them schizophrenic. But they did not. And uh, therefore these people lived, and furthermore they lived in a fully integrated manner. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that a culture contains the, also the solutions to the problems, the way in which the problems can be dealt with, besides a way of defining them. Our culture defines them as being ill or sick people and says, let's put them aside. And we know that this contributes to worsening the disorder. Because it contributes to creating chronic forms. Other cultures see this differently. The problem is always the same. But it is seen, described and dealt with in different ways. And at least in this case, with much better results than we get. In spite of the fact that we're putting great resources and spending lots of money to uh, cope with this problem. So uh, looking for an, or, or seeing another culture also means looking for or finding different types of solutions. And if a person has hallucinations or delusions, 
I need not deny what is what is happening to him. But I can find different solutions if I look at that problem from with different eyes. Yes. I'm reminded that one. <laughs> I'm reminded um, here very much of um, the shifts idea which we would translate now into accounting. So the stimulus and its existence and its significance prior to coming with a solution and actually operating that solution. And I'm thinking also as you talk, of course, past cultures here some of the pictures we saw in the art gallery last night of ancient saints, they heard voices. You know, I'm sure they too could be defined as schizophrenic or they could be sanctified as a saint touched by holy ghosts. So we have many ways of talking about the existence of this stimulus and what it means, its significance and the solutions. But here we are in a culture, not just in Italy, but in the Western world, where we have this labeling solution within the culture of mental illness and finding a way to work with people for whom there are these symptoms, to hold it in a different way in our culture would require a massive shift in the system that we're in and in the culture of the system that we're in. Do you see any seeds, any signs of possibility of cultural change about this view of mental illness in the West? Um, from this point of view, in Italy, right now, we're going through a regression. And we're going back to labeling and even to a revision of uh, uh, Act 180. Uh, Act 180 is which is the, the act under which the uh, psychiatric hospitals were closed down. And this is being done without any public debate. Uh, saying that it didn't work, but without saying why it didn't work. But the figures uh, give an opposite story. Because some disorders have disappeared. Catatonic uh, uh, schizophrenia no longer exists in Italy, for example. And chronic schizophrenia has by far decreased. And paradoxically, we're spending one-fifth less compared to what was spent before. Uh, earlier in the group, we were speaking about the effects of uh, fear, the uh, uh, and uh, a lack of security, insecurity uh, in culture, the effects of this on culture. Insecurity leads people to stiffen, to, to become more rigid. and they become attached uh, 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 to their own culture and are unwilling to think of anything different. And this, the current economic situation is uh, contributing to, the, is conducive to this uh, 
um, uh, uh, questa, um, this, chain, this going backwards. Uh, it may seem a paradox, but uh, all my hopes uh, are within the, uh, or I attribute them to the economic situation. Because uh, besides being more effective, a, a, a community psychiatry is also less expensive. And there's a figure that is not quoted very often. Ah. This is a figure that is not quoted very often. Uh, the, the asylums used to cost a lot. And paradoxically, if we don't go back to opening up uh, uh, um, houses for mental people, it'll be thanks to the economic situation, which is so bad. So from a systemic point of view, perhaps something good comes out of a negative situation. Yeah, it's very interesting, that connection of recession with regression. And that metaphor you use of the culture stiffening, a stiffening. Um, and again, I hear echoes of Burns' ideas of rigidity um, versus viscosity, which he talked about um, in his books. And this, this ebb and flow mm -hmm. through historic time between mm -hmm. ebb and flow, ah. coming and going. So we must also think about culture across time. Thank you, Orlando, for beginning in one place and ending in another. <laughs> yeah. And I am going to hand to Sylvia.